Good morning and welcome to Space Lab J Crew Post Flight Press Conference. I'd like to turn the program over to the Commander, Hoot Gibson. Go ahead, Hoot. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you after the conclusion of a very successful mission. Uh, we, of course, are the crew of, of Space Lab J, uh, STS-47, which, of course, was the 50th flight of the space shuttle. And I'd like to reintroduce the crew. Uh, right to my right, our mission pilot, Major Kurt Brown, who was making his first flight aboard uh, Space Lab J. Our payload commander, mission specialist number one, Mark Lee, making his second flight aboard Space Lab J. Our flight engineer or mission specialist number two, Jay App, making his second flight on this mission. <coughs> mission specialist number three, Jan Davis, making her first flight aboard STS-47. Our mission specialist number four, Dr. Mae Jemison, making her fi first flight. And our payload specialist number one, Dr. Mamoru Mori, uh, the first Japanese astronaut making his first flight aboard STS-47. We're here today to tell you our story, to tell you the story of Space Lab J, and I think we can best do that with some of the images from the mission. So with that, if we can uh, start the video, uh, the crew will describe the mission as we saw it using our video images and our still images. Well, at T-minus six seconds, uh, main engine was starting, and uh, shortly at T-zero, we started the 50th mission of the space shuttle. Once we're clear of the tower, we began our roll maneuver, which puts us in the orbital plane that our mission would be in, and that was 57 degrees of inclination. And shortly after liftoff, uh, we reached 20,000 feet, and already by then we're at uh, Mach 1, and you'll be able to see some of the shock waves off the external tank and solid rocket boosters. And not much longer after that, about two minutes into the flight, uh, we've used all the energy we can get out of our solid rocket boosters, and we separate from those. And now we're only on the, uh, the main engines for another eight minutes. Once we got up, uh, we turned our uh, rocket ship into a spacecraft by opening the payload bay doors there and got ready uh, to activate that laboratory you see in the back. And heading down the tunnel, uh, the more I look at this picture, it's kind of like uh, taking the subway uh, to work here. Uh, it's about uh, 20 feet long, and uh, it's fun to go down. You just give a push off at one end. You have to make a little jog as you go into uh, the the lab here and you can see you got to stick your hand out to stop <laughs> a little bit but once you're in the lab uh, we started activation we got back there about three and a half hours into the mission and the activation went uh, very smoothly yeah red ship started working on uh, material science experiment uh, this is a crystallization experiment using image mirror furnace and i became also a subject of four different uh, japanese experiments uh, this is a uh, uh, perceptual motor function experiment using a joystick and uh, in those experiments scientists on the ground uh, checked my eye movement while I attempted to track the uh, flickering light. Twice a day of course we would hand over the vehicle. We were working a dual shift mission. We had the red shift and the blue shift so in the morning we'd hand over from blue to red. In the evening we would hand over from red to blue uh, handing over both the orbiter functions and the space lab. On the blue shift, we did the free flow electrophoresis experiment, which is a Japanese experiment. We're passing electrical current through uh, some biological materials to separate them out according to their electric potential. We uh, had three of these experiments scheduled, and we were able to do two extra ones during the flight. So we feel like we had a really good uh, experiment there, very successful, even though we did lose some of the downlink data. One of the experiments that you've heard a lot about was lower body negative pressure. And these are just images from the lower body negative pressure. The objectives of that experiment was to really see how the heart adjusts to microgravity and to figure out, can you use lower body negative pressure as a countermeasure to help people to readjust when they come back? 
Some of the other experiments that we did that dealt with medical uh, issues were fluid therapy system. Um, the fluid therapy system we used really talked about uh, can you produce IV fluids in space and whether or not you're able to uh, successfully administer them. But we did spend a lot of time working with lower body negative pressure and we got lots of results back, good results back. While the space lab crew was busy working back in the lab, the orbiter crew was also busy on the mid-deck. We had several experiments uh, that we ran. Uh, one of these is the protein crystal growth, which uh, we see here being activated once we got on orbit. The, uh, another experiment we had going was a medical uh, data take of energy utilization, and we uh, collected uh, uh, some blood samples, tests for glucose, and we logged all the food and water and uh, some urine samples we took to better understand how the body actually uses the food that we intake while we're in a zero-g environment. The first thing I had to do in the morning right after I woke up uh, was to attach three different electrodes on my body. Except the fourth and fifth days, I wore all the time a backpack called uh, PMS and to monitor my electrocardiogram and uh, electrical wave and skin conductance level. Every day uh, in the afternoon, I wear this uh, and uh, I spent a couple of hours to uh, conduct cell culture experiments using a specially designed uh, culture kit and optical microscope. We mainly observed uh, how cells uh, develop under micro G and took many uh, microscopic pictures. Uh, I'm not sure if we had a record number of in-flight maintenance procedures, but we did have some fairly critical ones. Uh, early in the mission, we had a, a water leak in the material science rack, and we went in there, and it was a fairly uh, simple thing to fix once we took the insulation away. It was similar to just fixing a leaky faucet uh, at home, but it uh, kept the, the loop intact, and we were able to continue with furnaces such as this, which is the image mirror furnace. Uh, it was one of the uh, funner projects to work on on orbit because it was rather interactive. You had to establish a melt zone. In this particular scene, we're putting a quartz tube uh, around the sample. And then once we got the uh, image mirror closed, we went ahead and brought the samples uh, together. And uh, we bring them together so that the focus of the, there's a light bulb in the back and also one in, in, the, in the cover. Uh, the focus of the energy is on the gap between the two samples. Uh, this was uh, one of them that we did. Uh, we did two other uh, experiments in the, in the image mirror furnace. One of them was uh, a glass cube experiment. Uh, this glass cube, we were, the objective was to turn it into uh, a glass sphere and do some measurements. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the temperature got a little bit higher uh, than we expected. Uh, and I guess it's one of the reasons that you do experiments to try to understand the reaction to certain materials in zero gravity. And the other one that uh, was, uh, looks like it's very successful was our Samarskite sample. We have a sample here that's about Oh, I guess uh, you know, six to eight millimeters long. In addition to the image furnace, we also had uh, some other major furnaces in the two material science racks. We had four other major furnaces, including this one, which was a continuous heating furnace, which had two heating chambers and two cooling chambers. Of course, we also had the large isothermal furnace and the gradient heating furnace, as well as our acoustic levitation furnace, which we were able to uh, conduct our experiments because we had the uh, the water leak fixed in the material science racks for a total of 22 material science experiments. We had a couple of audio dosimeters that we kept in place in different parts of the orbiter. Every time I came back to do one, uh, the payload commander accused me of coming back to perform pilot science. So this is a little bit of pilot science that we're seeing right here. <laughs> and uh, this is a, a study in angular momentum. And of course, we're all familiar with the way an ice skater uh, starts out with their arms out and retracts their arms to increase the uh, rotational speed. And uh, our pilot is here uh, checking it out to see that it does, in fact, work in, in weightlessness. <laughs> this spooled him up pretty good. Watch, watch his <laughs> eyes when he finishes. <laughs> We had a uh, relatively new piece of gear on board, the bicycle ergometer, and uh, this is really a, a, a wonderful contraption, and we were uh, able to use this up on the flight deck, and it's quiet enough that we're able to, to exercise during sleep periods. Well, after a busy day of doing experiments and uh, working out, 
we headed for the galley, and the chow up there is really pretty good. Here's uh, Mark making the meal, and uh, we were very fortunate to eat uh, early and often during this mission, <coughs> and uh, we all liked it. And we found uh, chopsticks up there are pretty practical in zero G, although uh, you'll notice our Japanese payload specialist is having cross-cultural experience. He's the one using the spoon. Uh, but we found uh, curried rice up there was superb, and uh, I'm going to recommend taking it uh, as a standard item. Chopsticks were real good for most of the foods we ate up there, but not for all of them, so we used other techniques uh, for uh, certain foods that we ate there. And here you'll see it um, getting ready to get dark up there, which of course it did 16 times a day, and it, uh, it gets dark in a big hurry, as you're just about to see uh, out the window there right behind Kurt. Just like on Earth, uh, you have certain personal hygiene things you uh, must take care of. This is the red shift, getting up and getting ready to go to work for a day and uh, doing a little uh, teeth brushing there and uh, washing our hair. And uh, our commander, you know, he, he can only do so much with what you got to work with, but <laughs> he's, uh, he's doing his best here. And it's actually pretty easy in space. You don't have to find a wall to hang your mirror on. You can kind of just let it hang around. But uh, he's, he's working away there. It takes a little while to get ready in one. <laughs> I understand that four members of our flight uh, had a lot of interesting publicity down here. The fog embryology experiment was one that I think was very successful. We um, took four female frogs up. We, fer we uh, gave them a hemochorionic gonadotrophin, caused them to ovulate. We're able to actually uh, have over 100 live tadpoles that were brought back that were actually conceived and born in space. Uh, the experiment went very well. Uh, the results now, the investigators are out at Ames Research Center working uh, busily on things, but very generally, the gross appearance of the tadpoles that were conceived in zero G are, look very normal. They seem very normal. So it was a, a good experiment. One of the things we also wanted to look at was how, what was the behavior? Was there a problem with um, their tadpole's interpretation of what goes on in zero-g, can they swim normally? So we actually took up tadpoles that were hatched here on the, on the ground and watched their swimming behavior. Some of the things it seemed like is that they had a difficult time figuring out um, which way to swim, as you can see, so they swim in circles. But we're able to uh, bring tadpoles back down and also observe their behavior. We also did our uh, studies on a blue shift of angular momentum, and since I am an ice skater, it was uh, kind of fun to play with pulling my arms in, going faster, and then putting them back out and uh, slowing down. We also had fun with uh, other things and watching the physics of how they behave when we spin them around with a pair of pliers. Jay's using Thorax, which is a must have radio equipment to communicate uh, directly to the people on the ground. We contacted many schools around the world. Uh, here, we flew over Japan. It was very impressive for me to see my hometown uh, from space. This is Hokkaido, uh, just uh, we saw, uh, Northern Island of Japan. Sapporo is the capital of the, uh, Hokkaido, where I used to work. Now, most of the time when we flew over Japan uh, uh, was cloudy, but I had uh, one time to see a Tokyo metropolitan area. I was very much impressed that uh, Tokyo Bay was very clean, as you see there. This is Hurricane uh, Bonnie, which was about 500 miles north-northeast of uh, Bermuda when we took this photo, and you can see the spiral bands around in the well-developed eye. It's a classic hurricane. Just after that, we got ready to check out the vehicle uh, for landing, and here we are checking out the elevons during what we call the flight control system checkout. You can see them moving back there uh, on uh, the wing in this wide-angle view. And we were well satisfied the vehicle was ready for entry, and so was the ground. Well, after a very successful mission, it's time to come home, even though we got an extra day. So we had to prepare the vehicle for entry, got in our suits, got all strapped back in. Uh, made our deorbit burn, and that was very successful, and we're on our way home. This is a view out my window. We're in the, the red is a glow from entering the atmosphere, the, uh, the excitation that orbit does, and you can see the sunrise. We're in a big right bank at that point. Uh, back uh, in the lower atmosphere, with a hoot flying here, we are uh, starting to get some uh, tips off the wings, 
and uh, then doing some more checking we'll be in our right turn here on our heading alignment circle preparing to roll out on final uh, to complete the landing phase the uh, orbiter as you see looks like it's uh, a very nice flying aircraft uh, it looks very uh, very happy in that environment there uh, on the ground it looks like it's uh, falling like a brick as we probably all know <laughs> We had had a lot of concern about the weather at the Cape and being able to get back in there, but as you can see, we had just an absolutely beautiful day to come back to uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Air suit rolling out on final, and uh, shortly you'll see him put the nose down a little bit. We'll pick up some more airspeed and uh, prepare for the final landing phase. Uh, I got to fly the orbiter for a few seconds uh, on entry, and uh, thanks to Hoot, and uh, the, uh, the orbiter flies very nicely. It flies like a much smaller aircraft than it really is. Uh, very nice handling machine. A view from the vertical assembly building as we come in, you can still see the, the, the moisture off our uh, wings. Getting ready, my primary job in life now is to put the gear down. There comes the gear. And uh, there's the commander coming in for a very, very spectacular landing. Uh, hit all the parameters that we're looking for as we come in to land. Very nice touchdown. We touched down at 205 knots. And uh, shortly after that, uh, we were calling out airspeed. We we're looking for 175 knots, and at a point we, uh, I got to deploy the drag chute. We were the first uh, deploy with the nose still in the air, a test that we are doing to hopefully expand the envelope, and then the nose touched down about 130 knots. Approaching about 60 knots, we've gotten about all we could out of the drag chute, so we go ahead and jettison, and then we let the orbiter roll to a stop like in the previous mission. As I mentioned, this was the conclusion of a very successful mission. We had just uh, one, one redshift handover, one redshift tag up left to make. And this is uh, <laughs> Kurt and I having our final redshift tag up just after we'd rolled to a stop.